Hello and welcome to this webcast from Food Service Consultant Society International, FCSI. My name is Michael Jones. I'm the Editorial Director for Progressive Content in London in the UK and Editorial Director for FCSI's Food Service Consultant magazine. Many thanks for joining us today for this webcast, which is looking at the future of the food service sector in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, EMEA. Um, this is the first in a series of webcasts looking at how the food service sector is recovering from the massive and debilitating impact of COVID-19 in each major geographical region of the globe, uh, assessing the growth opportunities, the challenges in each region post-pandemic. This webcast is kindly sponsored by the leading equipment manufacturer, Myco. Uh, please check out their website, myco-global.com for more details. And I'm very pleased to report that as we limited registration uh, exclusively to the first 100 signups, we have reached that number, in fact, massively exceeded it, uh, and so have a full house today for the webcast. We have registrants from all over, and I think pretty much every European country is represented, as well as across the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, the UAE, plus South Africa and Ethiopia, as well as a lot of registrants from the US, uh, as well as Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, India, Singapore. Uh, so while our topic today is very much a mere focus, uh, there's definitely a global interest in the topic and seeing what we can all learn from other regions as they emerge out of lockdown. Our audience today is a very eclectic mix of uh, food service consultants, of operators, caterers, dealers, distributors, equipment manufacturers, marketing and PR professionals. We even have a registrant from an airline dialing in. Uh, the webinar will be presented by a real expert uh, in his field, Global Data's Consulting Director, Mark Dempsey, who I shall hand over to in a moment. Uh, Mark will be presenting for approximately 20, 25 minutes, and then he will take some questions uh, at the end of the session. You will therefore be able to submit questions to Mark during his presentation using the uh, question column on this platform, and then I can put those questions to Mark at the end of his presentation. I would ask, please, that those questions are not too niche, too narrow, too specific. They're saying about broad food service trends, opportunities, growth and potential uh, and the challenges in the EMEA region. Mark would be very happy to answer those at the close of the session. Um, I should add, uh, finally, that Mark will also be presenting uh, another uh, webcast for us, the next one in the series, which focuses on uh, the future of food service in Latin America. It's another area that Mark specializes in. This will take place three weeks from today on Wednesday, the 29th of July at 4 p.m. UK time, 4 p.m. BST. Details you should be able to see on your screen now. Uh, more information on that one will be shared on fcsi.org and across all of our social media channels. Sponsorship opportunities for that webcast uh, still exist. So if you'd like to sponsor it, please do get in touch with my colleague Natasha Merkel whose email address you can see uh, on your screen. If you can't quite make that out, it's natasha.merkel at progressivecontent.com. I'll also share Natasha's email uh, with you again at the end. Um, otherwise, back to today and back to EMEA, and I will now hand over to Global Data's Mark Dempsey. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Michael, can I just check, is that uh, screen share working correctly? It is correct, yeah. Fantastic, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Mark Dempsey here, uh, Global Consulting Director for Global Data. It's my pleasure to uh, bring to you uh, some content entitled Trends and Inspirations in a Time of Change. We're going to look specifically today at the future of food service in EMEA. And we'll do that by considering uh, a few perspectives. Uh, it's a changing world, so we should focus on change. We'll look at some of the ways that uh, consumer motivations are changing, the way some industries are changing. And of course, it goes without saying, uh, a look at the impact of COVID-19 uh, upon the immediate term and the potential into the longer term too. Uh, let's think about some of the changing industries, the changing consumers and the innovations and inspirations that might help us all uh, capitalize upon the opportunities and the challenges ahead. And then close with a few final thoughts in terms of moving forward. And as Michael says, I'll be very happy to take questions at the end of that. So some opening thoughts. We are an increasingly urban population. That's true around the world. It's particularly true in EMEA that we're studying specifically today. One of the interesting knock-on effects of a growing urban population is that convenience store numbers are increasing. 
Why is that important in a food service presentation? Well, it's important because many of the world's biggest and Europe uh, and EMEA's biggest convenience operators are focusing more and more on hot coffee, hot bakery, fresh food to go, premium food service offerings. So we already start to see that the world is changing uh, in a way that's favorable to food service uh, solutions. Indeed, it's not just about convenient stores becoming more prevalent as urban centers grow, but where we live is becoming uh, increasingly in EMEA, as an example, increasingly North American uh, in style with condo living, apartment living. So where and how we live, where and how we shop and eat will change. We will find increasingly uh, on every street corner, large convenience stores, quick service restaurants, fast casual restaurants. Uh, that food service boom, which we've been seeing in the last few years, it will bounce back. I will talk shortly about the very short term negatives that we've seen, of course, in the food service industry. But let's focus on the positives and think how we bounce back. And the way that we are choosing to live, the way that we are choosing to shop and eat and go about our daily lives will prove positive for the food service marketplace in EMEA. And now one of the things I'm fascinated by uh, most of all is gold standard in terms of brands standing out from the crowd. And many of you on the line today uh, may well be surprised to hear me call Burger King out as being best in class in terms of marketing, inclusivity, bold and innovative statements. But I just wanted to share a few examples with you. The one on the left, social distancing Whopper is maybe my favorite piece of, uh, let's say COVID related marketing I've seen, the Whopper with triple onions that keeps others away from you. Um, there's no reason not to have fun. We're in a, a, a very sad, very dire set of times that are causing, uh, let's say, huge frustration, huge concern for millions and millions of people around the planet. But food service at its heart is fun. Uh, and I think this is a great balance that, uh, that Burger King have struck. On the right hand side, however, this is an example from Brazil from late 2019, where actually their television commercials have started to feature um, uh, disabled uh, or inclusive themes. So actually their latest TV commercial uh, features a blind, uh, let's say, lead protagonist uh, talking about Braille in their restaurants with subtitles on the uh, and uh, voiceovers, I mean, on their uh, TV commercials. Uh, this is best in class. Uh, social marketing. Uh, and if we also start to think about the hard times that many people are seeing today, we also have Burger King in the US as an example, uh, BK cafe subscription, $5 a month, get a coffee every single day of the month rather than spending five bucks on a latte. So not only thinking about premium messages, not only thinking about inclusivity messages, also thinking about value. Uh, so let's keep all of those ideas in mind as we move our way through. Uh, on this slide, I've got a couple of examples using Global Data's consumer surveys. So uh, all of the numbers and facts and figures from a consumer standpoint that you'll see today come from Global Data's own proprietary consumer surveys. I did just want to pause here and mention the environment, ethics, values. It's a trend that we've been seeing in the last few years. It's a trend that as soon as COVID-19 is, is resolved and we're moving forwards back with full confidence that we expect the environment ethics values to remain absolutely critical to your consumers and therefore to your partners, your retail partners, manufacturer partners. So within food service, environment is actually impacting many decisions. 81% of global consumers find living a sustainable lifestyle to become important or very important. And indeed, with the stat on the right hand side, we find people actually saying that being sustainable is even more important than, to them than increasing salary, if you can believe that. So an example there of just how important ethics, the environment, sustainability is going to be for all of us as we try and bounce back even stronger in the future. Now, talking about a health trend, uh, talking about the need for consumers to focus on wellness it is nothing new. It's been a very significant trend for some time. Another quick example before we really start laser focusing in on EMEA, I just wanted to share this uh, retail innovation with you from Kroger. We know everything is cyclical. We know that uh, trends, in innovations, inspirations will move around the world, will move between channels. One of the things I've seen recently is trends, let's say, migrating from food service to retail and back again. So here's something that we would expect to be seeing as becoming more and more important in food service. Kroger's health and wellness online platform, Opt Up actually proactively recommends nutritional uh, options, uh, replacement options that are slightly healthier, slightly better for your diet. 
And of course, that's absolutely in line with the fact that increasing numbers of consumers are looking for health proactively. And in fact, we've already seen that kind of that kind of app, that kind of uh, technical solution migrate into food service. Uh, there's a really great uh, example in the US, again, very similar to the Kroger app from a fast casual restaurant uh, called Piada. So leveraging that need for both tech and health and proactivity uh, and individual health needs to ensure that Piada's consumers uh, can leverage the healthiest solutions while also driving loyalty, uh, which is a great, uh, a great combination. Okay, the world has changed. We should uh, uh, identify a few COVID related ideas, uh, both globally and also specifically for EMEA uh, now. We're heading towards 12 million cases. Uh, around about four and a half percent of those cases are proving fatal. There's a similar numbers in the uh, uh, in the EU. 540,000 deaths uh, as of July 7th globally, uh, and in the EU, um, uh, 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 let's say 130,000 of those deaths coming from the EU, uh, with now nearly three million cases. So uh, the EU is uh, is seeing a challenge, although in most instances, as we can see shortly bouncing back uh, and looking to reopen in the right way. But despite looking to reopen in the right way, rapid change in business models is going to be required. The world is going to look different. Food service in EMEA is going to be different. How many businesses will be left? What will your competitive set actually look like? These are questions we have to address. Uh, now, using Global Data's own uh, uh, channel-specific uh, data, values and volumes, um, it's a pretty bleak picture if we look back at Q2 2020 compared to uh, uh, the previous, uh, the same quarter in the previous year. We see declines, of course, in every continent, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Western Europe, Middle East and North Africa, double digit declines across every single one of those main profit sector channels. So one of the things we must focus on is how do we start to bring that back? Well, there will be significant EMEA food service closures. We've already seen the owner of Cafe Rouge and Bella Italia just in the last few days entering administration. Uh, we've seen the, the, the um, significant and successful German restaurant chain Vapiano filing for insolvency amongst others. And actually, if we just take a pause and even think back to when this really was beginning to start, beginning to get on everyone's radar, 6th of April, former CEO of Starbucks said, if we don't provide a backstop for restaurants, I suspect we could see a situation in which approximately 30% or more of small independent retailers never reopen. Uh, well, that was already a pretty dire statement, but actually it's spread into the, some of the big chains as well. So not only those smaller independent operators across EMEA struggling, uh, they had fewer reserves, of course. But actually, this has become so significant, even Howard Schultz didn't necessarily expect it to spread to some of the biggest chains. And we should expect to see closures over the next six months. Now, some will grab opportunities. A rapid change in business models is required. Those operators uh, within EMEA that are happy to be brave and bold, move into aggressive uh, merger and acquisition um, and takeover strategies may well be strongly positioned to be the winners in the future. Uh, only recently announced uh, Carluccio's administration, and then suddenly we see uh, Boparan uh, owners already of Giraffe and Ed's Easy Diner, uh, successful um, uh, successful full-service full restaurants, proactively and quickly and aggressively moving to acquire Carluccio's. So very interesting times for those prepared to be bold. Uh, and certainly at Global Data, we would recommend bold strategies uh, to grab the opportunities available to you now, grow share while you can. Now, one of the very interesting things that's been happening in the last few months, and particularly in the last few weeks, is some inconsistencies. Inconsistencies not only across different EMEA countries, incredibly inconsistencies within some countries themselves. So for example, we see different levels of positive news coming out of Spain. That's really important 
for those of you on the line who are manufacturers, partners to the food service industry, understanding the exact position by region within each of your countries and by channel within each of those regions uh, is going to become critical so you can understand exactly how to best support your operator partners. So, for example, in Andalusia, Madrid and Barcelona, all following starkly different paths out of lockdown in terms of what can and cannot be done within the food service industry. This is immediately different from what we've seen in Germany, as an example. Different countries, different channels are uh, instigating different track and trace methodologies, instigating different rulings in terms of dine-in or only taking away. Now, we need to see, let's say, over the next few months, more of a consistent approach before consumers, I believe, will become genuinely comfortable with coming back into the food service industry. So talking of becoming genuinely comfortable, it's not really just about Wearing face masks and socially distancing, of course, that's a critical part to reassure consumers. But consumers will also want to be uh, taking measures to support their uh, preferred local industries, preferred local uh, breweries, coffee shops, etc. And what we're starting to see is this idea of uh, crowdsourcing, uh, local community sourcing. And the best example I've seen of this is this idea of healthy hour. Uh, bars, cafes, restaurants, as they start to reopen, encouraging consumers where they can to pay more. Don't just pay uh, the price of a pint. Uh, tip well. Add, uh, let's say, add some, add some spend where you can to support, uh, because many of these favourite coffee shops, bars that we all have, uh, are running exceptionally low on their reserves. And now is the right time, not only for consumers to seek reassurance from these outlets, but for consumers, let's say, to try to support and reassure uh, in return. Now, by tracking consumer behavior here at Global Data, which we've been doing for many years, we've actually started running on a weekly basis a COVID-19 uh, tracker, asking uh, consumers in large countries around the world, including several EMEA countries, uh, to update us on their thinking. Uh, this is in the uh, 12th or 13th week now. So we're starting to really understand the way that consumer changes in motivation, changes in perception, changes in levels of concern are happening. One of the most revealing questions that we've been asking is what kind of information would you like from brands during the coronavirus period? Tips on personal health and well-being has been top since the very start and is now even collecting uh, about 55% positive responses. What's interesting as well is that consumers are asking that brands share as much news as possible about the initiatives that they've been adopting. So about 50% of consumers now saying we want brands to tell us proactively about what they've been doing, the initiatives that they've adopted, be it either from a, uh, let's say, uh, a welfare position or a, uh, uh, a security position uh, or uh, uh, the ability to, let's say, continue to innovate and continue to grow in the right way or just in terms of what they've simply been doing to ensure safe practice. So for any of you on the uh, on the call today um, thinking, what can I do? What can I do to drive sales, to reassure consumers? Really, the answer lies in those top two tips on personal health and well-being and candid, transparent statements about the initiatives adopted by your brands. Now, cause for some optimism seems to be seen in terms of numbers of consumers who are extremely concerned about coronavirus still, or those who expect the situation to improve in their country. Interestingly enough, the big red arrows point to the biggest negatives. Um, so in terms of uh, the, con the consumers who are most concerned about the global outbreak still, Brazil, India, US is beginning to now, uh, let's say, come into line with that. We're seeing that US number shifting up and up each week um, as, let's say, the reality hits within the US of the of the strength of the coronavirus and need for positive action. Uh, we'd certainly expect the US consumer to become more, more and more concerned over the next few weeks. But for those of us on the line in the EMEA region, we see relatively low UK numbers, Italy numbers, Germany um, and Sweden particularly. It's a pretty positive sign for consumer confidence within the EMEA region. And the slide on the right hand side talks about consumers who expect to see the situation improving. And the big red arrow is where uh, that number is actually decreasing. Brazil, South Africa uh, and the US 
consumers expecting the situation actually there to become worse. Again, if we think about EMEA, for those on the call today, the German number, the Italian number, Sweden and UK, all actually uh, getting stronger in terms of consumer confidence from that metric. So what I want to do in the next chapter, and just uh, teeing it up with this, uh, with this uh, slide here, food service outlets, outlets need investment to secure their futures. They don't just need increasing consumer confidence. The, se uh, the sector has been dramatically hit, reserves at an absolute low. And this kind of example is really best in class. For me, we're going to look at a few other examples in the next chapter. Diageo launches a $100 million recovery fund for the hospitality industry. Great news for all alcohol-related uh, 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 outlets. Great news for the food service industry as a whole. Great news for the consumer. Uh, and so let's start to think about ways in which the industry and the consumers um, can continue to change and continue to grow. Uh, one of my favorite examples I've seen in EMEA uh, in the last month or two has actually come from the UK restaurant Coat Brasserie. So it's quickly acted to deliver coat at home, delivering high quality produce, let's say from the kitchen, cellar and butchery right to your door. So identifying that consumers are uh, moving immediately to retail, replicating food service experiences at home. Coat Brasserie sees that there is a real long term risk to that trend and wants to act now to pull consumers back to its brand. Uh, it, has, it retains its premium feel. It, uh, let's say, retains the opportunity for you to have a coat Brasserie style experience at home. I think this is one of the best in class examples of challenging directly consumers' expectations that they simply have to only go to retail now. A really positive move by a food service operator. And Freshie in Canada and the US, a uh, Canadian company that emerged, uh, I think, uh, about 15 years ago, but has grown exponentially in the last five years as that fast, casual and, and, and fresh organic feel has grown, has actually moved quickly to immediately target the evening meal occasion, somewhere they didn't necessarily play particularly strongly before, with one of their leaders saying, as our customers continue to work from home, our introduction of a dinner focused menu felt natural and important to our business, giving lots of flexibility, fresh and quality uh, solutions uh, to consumers now around a wide, uh, a wide number of uh, countries. This is, again, best in class, bold, aggressive strategy designed to quickly steal back share um, and drive growth at a time where it's critical uh, to be taking a leadership position. Now, food service has been offer, offering for us uh, for a while examples of really great best practice. And I do want to talk about the importance of ethical positioning. Um, Gen Z, that youngest generation, let's say 15, 16, 17 years old, um, they are making clear that they want to know your values, uh, be it as a food service operator, as a manufacturer, as a partner to the industry. Tell Gen Z what you stand for. And nowhere does that better. Uh, and this is a very, uh, let's say, a fast growing uh, um, uh, EMEA brand now, obviously very well developed in the US and Canada. Um, it's why Shake Shack is standing for something good. Uh, I think it's best in class marketing. I think it's absolutely critical that we all try to leverage this kind of idea today. We stand for something good in everything we do. That means carefully sourced premium ingredients from like minded purveyors. And I just want to pause on that, that statement, like minded purveyors. The industry is moving, the food service industry is moving towards, I will only work with you if you share my values, if you share my ethics. So for those of you on the line that are manufacturers, distributors, partners to the food service industry, more and more you will be challenged by your partners. Do you share our values? Do you share our goals? If you do, we'll work with you. So let's keep this in mind as we all try to bounce back even stronger that this is a great example of how to drive loyalty from within the food service industry. Now, equally critical, we don't lose sight of the trends that were growing. Uh, the trends I'm going to show over the next few slides were all growing over the last few years, and they will continue to grow, we are sure. Uh, these are global numbers, but they are absolutely just as true, if not more so, within the EMEA region. So emphasize organic credentials, focus on premium and craft style. In the short term, as people are worried about disposable income, 
worried about uh, uh, employment security, uh, worried about, uh, let's say, uh, protecting their families, protecting their savings. Yes, we will see a move towards bulk buying in volume of private label brands, bulk buying in volume of tertiary brands to save money. But that overriding desire that we have been developing as EMEA consumers for organics, premium, craft, artisan, will come back as we gain confidence, as we see the market shifting. So this is true in retail and it's true in food service too. Leverage the fact that consumers want to organics, they want quality food and drink products. Leverage the fact that your consumers want to be experts and connoisseurs. This will remain a true trend. Also, what will remain true is the need for positivity. Now, this idea of uh, workday lunches or uh, um, workday snacking, etc., cetera, uh, as we've all been working from home, uh, has kind of been on the back burner. But as people begin to move back into offices, particularly, or at least back into more of a normal work to workday cycle, let's not lose sight of the fact that positive choices and focus on the right claims and benefits, ingredients to make me feel better, give me strength, give me energy, going to remain critical. And one of the things I expect to see happening over the next few months, consumers starting to think about, how do I boost my immune system? How do I get the right level of, uh, of, uh, of um, benefits, of, uh, of vitamins in my daily diet when I'm at work? Um, so think about in the food service industry, uh, and it's also true in, for example, impulse uh, snacking within retail too. How do I really help that consumer make their positive choices? In the food service world specifically, and also in wider retail, I'm positive that positive choices, benefits, health claims, ingredient claims will become increasingly critical to success. And in fact, just mentioning retail there, because on this slide, I just wanted to draw attention to the fact when a global uh, giant such as a 7-Eleven starts giving space to suja organic kombucha on its shelves away from some of the more traditional, let's say, carbonated soft drinks that we could all name. I think that's a great indication of a food service trend that is now so significant it's migrated all the way through into retail and just will gain pace and importance from there. So about two thirds of global consumers tell us I want fresh, natural, and organic as a critical factor when I am choosing where I'm going to eat and drink out. So 7-Eleven actively moving towards trying to steal away from that food service eating and drinking out occasion by leveraging health, leveraging organic, leveraging fresh and natural in their beverage aisle. And one thing I did just want to pause on, thinking about gold standard messaging, thinking about a food service operator uh, that has really, for me, created uh, the halo statement, the compelling statement as to the way that food service is moving. This is from a study tour I led in New York um, uh, just over a year ago, uh, a fast casual food service operator called Dig, really best in class for me in terms of, let's say, a mission statement, a brand statement. We buy food from farms, we roll with the seasons, we make meals from scratch. Now that to me talks about quality, individual quality, premium foods. This, this is a differentiated solution and it brings out all the very best offerings that uh, food service has. We cook for you as a person, we serve mostly vegetables. We want you to eat at a table. Now, of course, post COVID that becomes a little bit harder. Uh, I'm sure we will return to a normal where that can be encouraged and we nurture the next crop. We're thinking about you, we're thinking about your children, we're thinking about the health and, and benefits of you and the planet too. Best in class values messaging from the US, but we can all learn from that in, in EMEA and challenge ourselves, what do I stand for? So let's just think about moving forwards. Uh, with that in mind, what do I stand for? Also, what will my consumers want from me? Well, meal occasions will change. EMEA consumers' needs will change, and that brings opportunity. So think about how you talk about your values and your ethics. Think about how you talk about your premium solutions, your value equation. But also think about the fact that consumers will be thinking more about these six things. Socially conscious promotions, community spirit that we've all seen over the last few months. Instagram-worthy takeout. This trend of wanting to go into a restaurant and photograph my food is not going to go away, but it's going to shift towards takeout or take home. 
repurposed restaurants. More and more local eateries are going to evolve using, uh, uh, let's say, using uh, temporary spaces or trying to capitalize upon a fast new trend that has emerged. Restaurant branded meal kits. As I mentioned earlier, the idea about immune boosting menu items. How do I make myself healthier? This coronavirus has made me think about my overall health. How do I get fitter? How do I get stronger through the foods I choose to eat? And then also food and alcohol pairings. How do I, uh, how do I make the right choices now? Uh, maybe that's uh, thinking about what can I actually uh, get from the food service industry and take home, pair with alcohol from the retail industry. So re regulations around takeout and delivered with alcohol may well relax. So this may well present its own option as people start to think about recreating food service experiences in their own home. So don't forget the alcohol pairing as an idea. Now, I've mentioned retail a couple of times. As I mentioned, we do see, a, let's say, a pretty circular relationship, trends migrating between one and the other. And one area where I am positive that food service can and should lead is within the retail space. It may surprise you to hear that this is actually a supermarket in, uh, uh, in Germany, just outside Dusseldorf, uh, a fabulous uh, brand called Edeka Zerheide. Um, very creative, investing millions and millions in their overall store formats over the last few years. And two of my favorite examples of how they've been trying to uh, innovate in the retail space but using food service uh, can be seen here, the mozzarella bar, uh, the champagne club bar. These are as you move your uh, trolley through the store, encouraging you to take a break, sit down and use food service to drive spend, drive loyalty, increase quality, uh, and ensure that you become more and more loyal to Edeka Zerheide rather than just leaving the store and going having a food service experience somewhere else. So important to me, not to only think about how we improve food service within traditional food service formats, but really beginning to think outside the box, thinking about how food service can leverage sales in all formats. Makes me wonder with what's been happening recently as I think about retail and maybe how something can come back as a learning into food service rather than the other way. If maybe this was the future after all, I'm sure all of us have seen uh, some of the uh, concept stores in uh, particularly Chicago and Seattle has a couple of famous Amazon Go just walkout stores. And until now, it's been a luxury. It's been a series of concept stores. But it does make me wonder the way that we are becoming slightly more cautious as consumers in terms of how many people must I interact with. If food service cannot immediately begin to learn from this, uh, this technology, perhaps it's something worth investigating now. Will your partners be demanding this in the near future within the food service space. Because your, cli your clients, your partners, they'll be investing a lot in innovation to drive experience, to drive sales within food service. Now is the time, as I've mentioned, where the most aggressive, the most assertive, the most bold strategies will likely be the ones that help grow share and grow value and drive trade and loyalty. So the message I believe is clear, innovate, seek new ways to capture consumers. That might be through helping your partners look for new sales channels, new engagement potentials, potential business remodeling, or reinvigorating offerings, uh, but always maybe with an eye on the price in the short term to ensure that there is that quality and value balance as consumers certainly for the next six months, I expect will remain cautious about their spending, but desperate to move back into the food service industry. I'll just finish with another quick reference to Burger King. I started by saying I think they're best in class in terms of the marketing recently. Don't forget to have fun. These are serious times. Uh, these are very challenging times. Businesses are suffering, uh, but there's always an opportunity to use food service for a little bit of lighthearted entertainment. It's why consumers will come back to food service to have fun. I think Burger King is absolutely uh, nailing that, particularly with this socially distancing use of their famous crowns. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you all for your time, uh, remind you all maybe to uh, not only find the right solutions in terms of product, price, assortment, how to partner, but how to have fun in the food service industry. Again, that's what consumers will come back for. It's what they're looking to us for. And I think it's going to be a really critical element of how we can, let's say, bring everyone back and really drive growth into the future. And I'll just finish with this uh, famous uh, Chinese proverb. The best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago, but the second best time is right now. Uh, I'd love to be able to talk to you all uh, after this call and maybe think about how we can think about some of those seeds to plant together. Thank you very much.
Well, Mark, um, I just want to thank you very much for such a superb and very comprehensive presentation. Um, I have got, uh, we've got a couple of questions in from uh, our uh, audience, but what I'll do in the meantime is just put this back on screen. Right here. Okay, and let me just ask you one question, Mark. You mentioned um, some, some interesting trends that were peaking, uh, I guess, just before uh, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, some of those are particularly interesting. You were talking about ethical positioning, fresh, organic, premium craft, artisan, and migration of retail trends. Which of the, the biggest trends of the last year or two do you think will continue to be the most dominant going into the second half of 2020 and into 2021? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Michael. Um, you've mentioned two of them there. I think the, the artisan trend um, uh, will will suffer for a short while and bounce back with a vengeance. Um, that idea of artisan trade, craft, handmade, let's say, handmade beverages, handmade sandwiches, uh, uh, tapas style, uh, let's say, uh, snacks, treats, main meals within food service has been an incredible growth for the last few years. Um, that's the one I would see being very challenged in the next six months, but bouncing back as consumers become more confident. Uh, and then I'll just pick on one of the other ones that you mentioned there as well. I think ethics, sustainability, the, the need to talk about our values, the need to talk about how we are focused on some of the big issues of today, not just bouncing back from COVID, not just doing the right thing from a, a social distancing perspective and a health perspective, but also talking about how we are considering general health issues, general inclusivity issues. As an example, uh, I, I think will remain critical. I'd encourage everyone on the line, wh whatever you stand for today, shout about it, be known for it, be famous for it, and continue on the journey as strongly and quickly as you can towards uh, ethical, sustainable, values-based propositions. Uh, it will differentiate you from the crowd. And particularly Gen Z, your consumer of the future, will, will love you more for it. Um, Mark, at the start uh, the, of the presentation, you were, you're painting quite a bleak picture of, of the current uh, scene in, across EMEA. Which sectors in perhaps the larger uh, EMEA economies do you think have got the toughest task of adapting to, to this new normal? So between fast, fast food, quick service, casual dining, fine dining, grab and go, which ones do you think will really struggle to adapt? Well, I think there's two ways. Two ways to answer that, uh, and thank thank you for the question. Where, where that wherever that came from, um, I think in terms of fine dining, um, fine dining again falls into that kind of remit of one of the ones that we would be most likely to sacrifice. Uh, it's kind of like in a recession, white goods and big holidays are the, are the first thing to go. Fine dining is probably going to be the, the, the first to go and the last to recover. Finding different ways to have a special occasion. Um, it was actually my, my in-laws um, 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a socially distanced picnic, seven of us. Now, now that probably uh, in, in days gone past or in years to come, uh, a gold wedding anniversary probably would have been spent at a pretty nice restaurant. Um, uh, so I think that's an example of uh, not just the fact that social distancing uh, and those legislations get in the way, but actually the fact that um, maybe people being more and more cautious in the future, do I, is this really the time to spend 150, 200 pounds on a really fine meal? I think that's probably gonna be a challenged one in the future. Um, I would also say, any of those, uh, any of those industries, um, particularly trendy bars, uh, coffee shops that would normally be very tightly packed of a morning, uh, trendy burger joints. Um, uh, we can all think of our favourite kind of fast, casual, very experiential burger joints, where you're generally ending up shoulder to shoulder with the person next to you in a twenty-person queue. I think that's going to, I think that's going to struggle. I think people are going to look at that and think twice about eating in crowded spaces, standing in long lines. Um, so I'd say maybe um, smaller niche, fast, casual um, players where big big crowds are expected or big queues and then fine dining, I think, is is, a, is an obvious one to slow, slowly recover. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Marco, uh, who is uh, dialing in from Brazil. He has asked, uh, talking about the adaptation, uh, the next phase for the restaurant industry, 
So what, what are some of the tools or tasks for independents and small companies to, in, in the face of competition against huge corporations in this new market? How can they adapt and survive? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting one. Um, uh, particularly if, if we think about the way that the biggest chains, uh, the biggest manufacturers, uh, the biggest chains uh, are, are protected to a degree. Uh, and I'm not saying it hasn't been hard for them. It has, but much bigger uh, reserves, uh, significant supply chains. Um, they're more of the, sl let's say, the slow moving oil tanker protected, if, if you like, from, uh, from, from, uh, from harsh conditions. Um, I kind of prefer to think of the... Uh, um, the kind of companies that's been mentioned there in the question almost is like the the speedboats moving around the oil tanker so almost uh more easily able to to, to navigate change course react and that's exactly what i encourage you to do uh think about some of the most important consumer trends react quickly uh what are some of the most important consumer trends to which you might be able to react well um organics plant-based, vegan, uh, none of those trends are going away. Those are all trends that I think will become increasingly important. And they're the ones that are the hardest for the big, let's say, multinational FMCG providers, if you like, um, to actually really quickly adapt to. Um, the small players are better positioned to quickly change, quickly change direction, quickly back a new horse, let's say. Um, I would also encourage people in the food service industry to be thinking hard about the next new ingredients that are coming through. Um, people go into food service for an experience. They go into food service to have fun, to try something new. Don't stop uh, experimenting. Don't stop looking for the next new avocado. No, don't stop looking for the next new coconut milk. Um, now is the time to invest even more so in what's the next big thing that's going to pull people in and allow people to have fun. Um, so be bold and be brave and change quickly because you can. And I think that's what differentiates you from, you know, all of the big, let's say, FMCG or, or multinational restaurant chains that we could all name. Well, uh, before I get to the next question, could I just ask you to um, end your uh, screen sharing? Because I think we've got a road red screen there. Uh, Yes. Thank you very much. Um, question here then from uh, Tina in the UK. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, she said, "How you mentioned ingredients there and, and, and um, organic as a, as a huge trend, certainly pre-COVID. How do you square the consumer's demand for organic and high quality products with the inevitable reduction in disposable income? How can operators find a balance between the two? Yeah, uh, again, thank you. Great, great question. Um, I think I think I would need to look at this in the terms of a, a short term, medium term, long long term answer. Um, without any doubt, there is a need right now in the short term to consider value, to consider how do you reassure consumers that they can keep coming to you. Um, I, I think I, I would expect to see McDonald's in the next six months boom in terms of its sales. Why is that? Well, um, they might not have, let's say, the most loyal consumers around the UK, but everyone knows you can go to McDonald's and certainly not waste your money. Everyone knows you can go to McDonald's uh, and the whole family can have a pretty great experience uh, with some family favorites for 10 quid. Well, might not, with all due respect, might not be the best burger, but the whole family is going to go out and no one's going to felt like they've wasted their money. So I think in terms of ensuring value, um, looking for uh, some of those uh, less expensive solutions um, in terms of the brands that you might be offering, in terms of some of the products that you might be making. Um, for those consumers that do need to uh, be honest and, and save money and feel a pinch and be worried about job security, be worried about employment, it's critical that the, you do see that value. However, uh, again, this is where we need a short-term and long-term view. Don't back the value horse to the, you know, to the exclusion of premium and quality. Artisan will, artisan will bounce back. Premium will bounce back. Fast casual will, will, will absolutely bounce back. Everyone in the last five years um, has their favorite burger in the same way that everyone now has their favorite artisan coffee. Everyone knows how to customize their coffee in the right way. That's not going to go away. We've become dependent upon that. We love that as a society. Uh, it's particularly true in, in, in EMEA, actually. Um, so don't lose sight of that retain that quality retain the premium offerings uh but but um yes in the short term va value will become value will become critical fantastic thank you mark uh, we have a question here from nicola she has asked 
Are there any practical tips on what manufacturers could and should be doing now to prepare for when the sector moves into fuller recovery mode? Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Nicola. I uh, hope you're well. Um, I think in terms of uh, manufacturers from, from, um, from, from that standpoint, um, availability of core product is, is absolutely critical. Um, there is going to be a move back into food service. Uh, that will be true in the UK, true across all countries. The very worst thing that can happen is that consumers go back into food service. They identify that they've got £10 they available, they've, they want to spend. Um, for those people, particularly those who have been shielding, particularly those who have been sick, it, it could actually be a slightly anxious making move back into being public spaces. And I don't think enough is being said about that, if I can be completely candid. Um, you know, people have been exceptionally anxious. There has been a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, mental pressure upon many people. Um, and moving back out into the food service industry could be challenging uh, and could be, um, uh, could be anxious making. Now, the very worst thing to happen is you, let's say, put on a brave face, uh, the family goes out, you move into your favorite food service outlet and it's out of stock. The core products that you that you know and love are unavailable. Uh, and so I really would say, Nicola, in the very short term, absolutely critical that the, you know, um, keep the main thing, the main thing. Uh, availability of core products is absolutely critical. Be thinking now about um, advanced orders, be thinking now about logistics and supply chain issues that may come up to ensure you're ready to combat that and keep your um, your your uh, your retail uh, food service operators perfectly stocked. So availability is is never going to be an issue. Longer term, um, and, and I'm thinking five six months down the line here, we absolutely need to get back to that idea of global cuisines, global influences, the new ingredients. Then, as I say, the next new avocado, the next new uh, coconut milk, um, because uh, your partners, your food service partners. Uh, are not going to expect there to be any delay in getting hold of the next brand new innovative um, game changer, let's say. Um, and if you're not ready for that, they'll move on. They'll find someone else. So again, uh, sorry, Michael. It, again, it's a it's a short term and a long term strategy. I think I think we need both. Great answer. Thank you, Mark. And uh, finally, a question. Uh, this may be a little specific, Mark, but um, I'll ask it anyway. Question here from Richard in the Middle East. He, he'd like to know if you have any insight in terms of the um, expansion ratio or the rate of growth for uh, the chain accounts in the Middle East, considering the, the impact of COVID-19. So do you have any insight into hotel openings, in-house F&B, concept changes, anything like that? To, to be honest, yeah. yeah. <laughs> two ways of answering that yes we do and maybe michael you can put me in did you say richard is that is that the name yeah. maybe put me and richard in contact and, and i'll follow up after the call um yes we do global data is tracking that all of the time on a on a week by week basis daily in some instances um but it's changing so fast if i'm entirely honest to have presented anything on that today would have uh, probably already have been slightly out of date and a little bit niche so um yes we do have a view on that um i will i will use that as a chance just to say um, a good example is what's happening in the states with, um, uh, let's say, some states reopening and then suddenly realizing they've opened too quickly or they've opened too much and having to back out and change. We, we are beginning to see that in, in, in food service. There's been a few examples from Germany. Um, there's also been a few examples from Spain opening too quickly and realizing, oh, my goodness, we need to pump the brakes here. So there's also an element of something that global data is tracking, which is those that have opened too quickly and where we expect to see pulling back. Uh, and there's to be honest, quite a bit of that happening in the Middle East uh, and North Africa right now. So maybe, um, Mike, if you could put me in contact with Richard directly, I, I can answer that in some more detail from there. Absolutely. And, and I, th I think that's a great uh, kind of point to end on in the fact that um, Mark is very, very happy to share his presentation uh, with, with anyone who's, who's dialed in today. And uh, we will uh, do a short piece on the, on the FCSI website and you put Mark's contact details on there so you can uh, uh, contact Mark and he will uh, forward his deck on and, and, and I, I can put you in touch with him. So Mark's details will be on that story. Otherwise, that is all we have time for today. So I'm sure you'd all like to thank me in, in thanking Mark Dempsey from Global Data for a very absorbing and fascinating presentation, very comprehensive. I'd also like to thank Myco for their support. Please check out their website, myco-global.com uh, for more information. In the meantime, otherwise I should just leave you with a screen grab here for our next webinar. Uh, which is um, taking place on 
uh, Wednesday the 29th of July at 4 p.m. UK time. That's on the future of food service in Latin America. That's three weeks today. Also hosted uh, uh, by, by Mark. Uh, again, sponsorship opportunities ex exist for that particular website. Yes. So please contact Natasha Merkel for more information. Natasha.merkel at progressivecontent.com. Otherwise, thank you so much again to Mark. Thank you for dialing in. Uh, thanks for watching and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.